Hi everyone and welcome back to Minds and Machines with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. So today we're going to be continuing our discussion all about Thomas Hobbes and the Clockwork Universe. Before that, a little bit of recap since we did kind of change directions last time. You recall last time, one of the things that I tried to do was fill you all in a little bit more on the Abrahamic understanding of the soul. Because we've learned so far that at least the Greek rationalists equated the mind with the soul. Descartes does the same thing, as we saw. But we haven't really looked at the other side. We've looked at the Athens side of the coin, but not the Jerusalem side of the coin, right? So I gave you a bit of an overview of the Abrahamic understanding of the soul. And from there, we talked a bit more about mechanistic philosophy. Descartes uh, was a mechanistic philosopher. Thomas Hobbes is a mechanistic philosopher. Um, we looked at many other examples like Galileo, so forth. Um, but they all believed the universe was like a clockwork machine, right? Whereas some traditions, non-Western traditions typically, um, Eastern traditions, Aboriginal traditions, view the universe as maybe like a giant living being. Or if you're a pantheist, uh, the universe is God, right? God or nature, same thing if you're a pantheist. Uh, mechanistic philosophy is different. It looks at the universe as a machine. It's made of parts. The parts are, you know, matter, stuff. And it's all in motion. And it's all governed by laws, laws of nature, so that everything is determined uh, by these laws, as well as the prior conditions, right? That led us to discuss briefly a few of the different metaphysical outlooks when it comes to free will. So we talked about determinism, compatibilism, and libertarian free will, just because I want you to be aware of those things as we move forward through the course. I mean, if we live in a clockwork universe and we really are machines, then what does that mean for free will? Something you should keep in mind as we continue on through the class. And then finally, we began taking a look at Hobbes' Leviathan. Specifically, we looked at the introduction, and I also gave a little bit of background about Hobbes himself and what his project was all about. So today what we're going to do is pick up where we left off. I'm just going to briefly summarize uh, the intro once again, the intro of Leviathan, and then we're going to take a look into more of Hobbes's mechanical philosophy by reading selections from uh, parts one to five, or chapters one to five, of book one of the Leviathan, which is all about the human being. And by the way, I am riffing a lot today. If you have seen my slides, you'll know that most of it is just quotes from the text that I'd like to draw your attention to. So I'm going to be riffing on that a lot, reading things out loud and uh, explaining things further. Uh, I'm sure you all take notes um, in your own way, so just make sure that you keep taking notes in whatever way suits you for this lecture. So with that said, uh, why don't we take a brief look at the introduction of Hobbes Leviathan, published in 1651, once again. Uh, we'll just briefly go over that once more, and then we're going to take a look at chapter one, or rather book one, chapters one through five. Okay, let's get started. So last time, when we read through part of the introduction, we saw that Hobbes presents a very mechanical or mechanistic picture of the human being, right? He writes, Nature, the art whereby God hath made and governs the world, is by the art of man, as in many other things, so in this also imitated, that it can make an artificial animal. For seeing life is but a motion of limbs, the beginning whereof is in some principal part within, why may we not say that all automata, engines that move themselves by springs and wheels, as doth a watch, have artificial life? For what is the heart but a spring, and the nerves but so many strings, and the joints but so many wheels, giving motion to the whole body, such as was intended by the artificer? Right? So Hobbes is saying um, animals and humans are like clockwork mechanisms, and for that reason, why, we, why, why can't we also say that automata are also alive in the same way we are, right? Um, and of course, the whole idea behind this is that the state for Hobbes is like a giant artificial person as well. So if you recall, 
you know, that's why Hobbes devotes an entire book out of Leviathan to explaining the human being, because the state is an artificial human being. Can't explain how the state's going to work unless you explain how the natural human being works. So that's what Hobbes is doing here. He's giving a mechanistic account of the human being. And we will go on to look at some of the ways Hobbes thinks we're mechanical, machine-like, you know, almost like we're automatons made by God or something. Although, remember, Hobbes was accused of atheism, and he may, in fact, have been an atheist. So, um, in any case, we're like this uh, machine made by God, or a machine produced by nature, if you like. And we'll look at example passages of that today. So, let us start by taking a look at chapter one of Sense, which, as you may have guessed, is all about the senses. So in chapter one, Hobbes writes, the thoughts of man are every one a representation or appearance of some quality or other accident of a body without us, which is commonly called an object. Which object worketh on the eyes, ears, and other parts of man's body, and by diversity of working produceth diversity of appearances? The original of them all is that which we call sense. For there is no conception in man's mind which hath not at first, totally or by parts, been begotten upon the organs of sense. The rest are derived from that original. So there's a few important things we get here, actually, right off the bat. One which probably jumped out at you is Hobbes' empiricism, right? He says here, the original of them all, uh, the origins of these representations or appearances, are the senses. Um, and there is no conception in a man's mind which hath not at first totally or by parts been begotten upon organs of the sense. All these appearances or representations, Hobbes is saying, come from the senses. And if they don't, they're derived from what comes from the senses. That original, you know, the senses is the source of knowledge for Hobbes. So empiricism is something which jumps out at us right away here. And also, he's talking about thoughts as representation or appearance. You may have noticed that he uses the word representation, just like uh, in the sense that we talked about during our first proper lecture, the modern understanding of the mind. I'll place a card to that up here somewhere. Um, <clears throat> nowadays, we talk of mental representations a lot in philosophy of mind and cognitive sciences. And Hobbes is starting to... Uh, Change the vocabulary here, right? He uses representation, which is actually uh, quite a contemporary way of talking. I mean, that's how we talk about minds in the 20th and 21st centuries. Uh, but he also speaks of appearances or phenomena, right? So that's quite ancient. That's how the Greeks understood it. And what he means by representation or appearance is very much what Descartes means by idea, right? An idea is something that is seen in the mind. Plato's ideas, his uh, eidos, an idea, singular eidos, is that which is seen. And of course, Plato thought ideas were the most real things. Ideas were the forms, the true forms of things, right? But for Hobbes, um, a representation is what, uh, for Hobbes, is very much what Descartes is talking about when Descartes talks about an idea, right? Or an image. It's a mental image or something in the mind that has content, a mental representation. So that's another important thing that pops out here. How do the senses deliver these appearances or representations to the mind, though? Well, Hobbes thinks it happens uh, very mechanistically, of course. He writes, The cause of sense is the external body, or object, which presseth the organ proper to each sense, either immediately as in the taste and touch, or immediately, as in seeing, hearing, and smelling. Which pressure, by the mediation of nerves and other strings and membranes of the body, continued inward to the brain and heart, causeth there a resistance or counter-pressure, or endeavor of the heart to deliver itself, which endeavor becomes outward, seemeth to be some matter without. And this seeming, or fancy, is that which men call sense, and consisteth, as to the eye, in a light, or a color figured, to the ear, in a sound, to the nostril, in an odor, to the tongue and the palate, in a savor, and to the rest of the body, in heat, cold, hardness, softness, 
and other qualities, as we discern by feeling. All which qualities called sensible are in the object that causeth them, but so many several motions of the matter, which by, by which it presseth, presseth our organs diversely. So this is very mechanistic. There are things in the world, um, bodies, bodies in the world, or objects of sense, which somehow affect our organs immediately, as in when I touch this cup of coffee, I feel warm, right? I'm immediately being affected because the warmth of that coffee cup, Hobbes says, is, uh, you know, causing some kind of pressure on my nerves and membranes, which eventually reaches the brain. So that's what Hobbes is saying. Or it can happen indirectly, right? Uh, sound is mechanistic for Hobbes. It comes from objects that make sounds, uh, travels through, and it affects the ears somehow. And uh, it all happens mechanistically. Uh, stuff is moving around. It's matter in motion affecting the body. And the body is set up such that, um, you know, when light hits the eyes, we have sight. When sound hits the ears, we have hearing. Uh, when we touch something, we have a tactile sensation, hot, cold, soft, hard, these kinds of things. So that's how Hobbes thinks that these appearances or representations come to happen. It's, uh, it's all cause and effect, and it's all due to objects of sense in the environment, um, you know, causing some kind of internal motion, pressing on a nerve or a membrane or, or something, right, in this machine body that I have. And it's worth pointing out here that Hobbes disagrees with the Aristotelian school of thought on how the senses work. And we didn't talk a lot about this when we read De Anima, so I thought I would just briefly mention it here. Uh, Hobbes writes, But the philosophy schools, through all the universities of Christendom, grounded upon certain texts of Aristotle, teach another discipline, and say, for the cause of vision, that the thing seen sendeth forth on every side a visible species, or a visible shoe, apparition, or aspect, or a being seen. The receiving whereof unto the eye is seeing, and for the course of hearing that the thing heard sendeth forth an audible species, that is, an audible aspect, or an audible being seen, which entering the ear maketh hearing. Nay, for the cause of understanding also, they say the thing understood sendeth forth intelligible species, that is, an, intel an intelligible being seen, which coming into the understanding, uh, understanding makes us understand. I say not this. So um, Aristotle kind of understood um, perception is happening through, uh, like, uh, immediately, where if we see something, it's because it's sending some kind of beingness towards us that our sense organs and our intellect can can apprehend, right? And this has all got to do with form and matter and entelechy and all of that stuff we talked about earlier. Hobbes doesn't believe this. He doesn't think that there's some audible species or visible species that's emanated out from objects that we listen to or look at. It's all mechanical for Hobbes, right? Aristotle didn't understand sound as air, uh, as, as sound waves traveling through air or as light reflecting off surfaces and entering, <clears throat> excuse me, entering the eyes. Um, that's something that came later. Um, rather, Aristotle thought there was a visual, visual species or an audible species, right? He didn't understand it in the same mechanistic way that we do now, and that Hobbes and his contemporaries were starting to understand it during the early modern period in Europe. So, just a couple interesting things to bring up from chapter one. Uh, to show you that, you know, Hobbes is putting together a very mechanistic picture of the human being. Now, let's move on to chapter 2, which is called Of Imagination. And here, uh, Hobbes talks a lot about imagination, dreams, visions, and this kind of thing. All right, let's have a look. So a lot of what Hobbes talks about in chapter 2, we would call nowadays uh, some kind of mental imagery right? He's talking about uh, visions and dreams, for example, here. Uh, these are kinds of mental imagery. The imagination itself uh, is primarily imagistic, right? It, imagination, image. 
uh, when we imagine something, yes, often we imagine um, sounds and smells perhaps, but the primary thing that happens is that we visualize something in our heads. So what does Hobbes say about the imagination or mental imagery in general? Well, he writes, When a body is once in motion, it moveth, unless something else hinder it eternally. And whatsoever hindereth it cannot in an instant, but in time and by degrees, quite extinguish it. And as we see in the water, though the wind cease, the waves give not over rolling for a long time after. So it also happeneth in that, uh, though in that motion, which is made internal, made in the internal parts of a man, then when he seems dreams, uh, sees dreams, etc. So when a body's in motion and something stops it, it just uh, doesn't come to rest instantly. It has to take a moment to slow down. When the wind stops blowing on the sea, the waves don't immediately go away. Likewise, all these external motions that affect our sense organs and cause um, appearances in the mind, uh, you know, when something stops affecting our senses, those internal sensations don't immediately go away. That's what Hobbes is saying. He continues, For after the object is removed or the eye shut, we still retain an image of the thing seen, though more obscure than when we see it. And this is it that Latins call imagination from the image made in seeing, and apply the same, though improperly, to all the other senses. So really Hobbes is saying you can imagine a smell it, or something like that, right? Even though a smell isn't an image. Uh, this is just what we call the imagination, as I said earlier. But the Greeks call it fancy, which signifies appearance, phenomena, and is as proper to one sense as to another. So perhaps the Greeks uh, have the better nomenclature here, Hobbes is saying. Imagine, therefore, is nothing but de uh, imagination, excuse me, is therefore nothing but decaying sense, and is found in men and many other living creatures, as well as sleeping as waking. So um, Hobbes is talking about the imagination as a kind of decaying sense, right? Um, if, if I look at this lamp here and shut my eyes, I can still have this impression of the lamp. I can have an appearance of the lamp. I can picture it in my mind. Um, but of course, uh, me picturing it is not as bright and vivid as the real lamp. It's kind of like a decaying sense, right? A decaying appearance rather than the thing itself. So Hobbes is saying imagination, uh, memory, uh, all of these things are actually quite similar. They're all kind of the part of the same faculty, right? He writes, this decaying sense, when we would express the thing itself, I mean fancy itself, uh, we call imagination, as I said before. But when we would express the decay and signify that the sense is fading, old, and past, it is called memory. So that imagination and memory are but one thing, which for diverse considerations hath diverse names. So imagination and memory are really the same thing. Uh, it's what we're doing with our mental imagery, Hobbes thinks, uh, that determines whether we're imagining or remembering something, right? Uh, I can picture this lamp after I've closed my eyes, but that's not really remembering. It is a decaying sense, um, but that's not really remembering. That's just picturing something. If I express that decay somehow by saying that in my apartment, uh, you know, say if I'm somewhere else and I'm trying to actively remember where the lamp is, trying to recollect where it is, using my mental imagery, um, that's memory, right? Um, and Hobbes connects this decay to the mechanisms of the body, especially the nerves and the brain. Nowadays, we don't quite uh, think of these things the same way, of course. I think that bears mentioning. Um, you know, nowadays, memory and imagination are understood to be uh, different faculties, right? And that's not to say that we don't use our memory visually um, or that we might imagine something that we remembered, but we do tend to distinguish these faculties nowadays. And indeed, we, dis we, we kind of sub-distinguish them too. Um, we have different memory faculties like long-term memory, working memory, uh, prospective memory, uh, procedural memory, 
um, semantic memory, uh, all kinds of different memory faculties. Likewise with imagination, we can visually imagine things. Uh, we might use our auditory imagination and imagine um, writing a little tune, for example, right? So we don't quite treat these the same the way Hobbes did, but Hobbes does treat them mechanically as we still do today, because uh, most neuroscientists will tell you that imagination and memory and all of this depends upon the brain. And there are disorders of memory and disorders of imagination uh, that we can actually tie to certain physical problems in the brain. Injuries, like acquired injuries like strokes, for example. Um, so, uh, let's move on. Let's talk about dreams for a bit. What are dreams for Hobbes? Dreams are kind of like what we would call an offline form of imagining. And um, I mean offline in the sense that there's no uh, information coming in from the senses, right? Because, of course, when you're dreaming, you're asleep. Um, and unless something really loud happens, like an alarm clock or something, you're probably not going to hear it and incorporate it into your dream. So dreams are offline mental imagery as opposed to, uh, you know, waking visual perception. My visual perception of the world, I guess, is technically mental imagery because it's my brain that's generating this experience that I'm having, but it's based on information that's coming in from my senses. So it's online rather than offline. Uh, maybe this will become clear when I read the full quote. Hobbes writes uh, here, The imaginations of them that sleep are those we call dreams. And these also, as all other imaginations, have been before, either totally or by parcels, in the senses. And because in sense the brain and the nerves, which are the necessary organs of sense, are so benumbed in sleep as not easily to be moved by the action of external objects, there can happen in sleep no imagination and therefore no dream, but what proceeds from the agitation of the inward parts of man's body which inward parts for the connections they have with the brain and other organs when they uh, be distempered do keep uh, the same in motion, whereby the imaginations were formerly made, appears as if a man were waking, saving that the organs of sense being now benumbed, so as there is no new object which can master and obscure them with a more vigorous impression, a dream must needs be more clear in the silence of sense than our waking thoughts. So we dream about things that are kind of uh, left over from the day, right? From the day's uh, sensing and perceiving. Uh, it's this kind of residual, um, you know, internal action these, uh, that, that, that these sense impressions have caused in us that will give rise to dreams. And this can happen because, um, you know, it's kind of like when when the sun is, uh, the sun has set, we can see the stars. Hobbes thinks things like this are going on in the mind when we're awake, too. Before this, he offers this nice analogy about how the sun, uh, during the daytime, blocks the sun. It's so bright, uh, the sun is so bright that the stars, rather, cannot be seen. Um, it's like this when we're awake. There's still a lot going on in the brain when we're awake. Uh, but it's obscured because, you know, our, our mental sun is up. We're awake and uh, aware. Uh, when we go to sleep, these other things that the brain is doing uh, are visible. Uh, it's like the sun setting and now we can see the stars. It's that kind of a thing that Hobbes is talking about. And for the rest, um, I believe Hobbes talks about... Uh, oh, well, we're getting into, um, we're getting into chapter 3 now, actually. I mean, for the rest of chapter two, uh, Hobbes does talk a little bit about visions and apparitions. Um, I'm not going to talk about those today, but if you're curious to see why Hobbes was accused of being an atheist, you should take a look at this part. Uh, he talks kind of scornfully about religious visions and, uh, and, and this kind of thing. Uh, so you can kind of get a little bit of a sense of why Hobbes might have been accused of that by looking at how he talks about religion from time to time in the Leviathan. But in chapter 3 of book 1, he talks about the train of imaginations. Here Hobbes is talking about mental discourse, and we still often 
uh, talk about moving from one thought to another in terms of mental discourse today. And Hobbes doesn't think this happens randomly. We don't have random thoughts and random imaginings. Um, we don't go from one random thought to another. What we think or imagine, rather, seems determined by what we previously thought or previously imagined. Again, this is very mechanistic, very deterministic. The original of all of this, remember, is the senses and what we get from the senses. So this, uh, even though I'm kind of skimming here, uh, is, is, is another place where we really see Hobbes' empiricism and his mechanistic philosophy shine through. And this idea of mental discourse we're going to pick up uh, even further in chapters 4 and 5. That's where the really important stuff is, which is why I just kind of wanted to mention this one part from chapter 3. Chapter 4, however, is all about speech. And Hobbes says some really interesting stuff here about what speech does for us, cognitively speaking. Uh, so let's take a look at chapter 4 briefly and talk about speech. So in chapter 4, Hobbes writes, The general use of speech is to transfer our mental discourse into verbal, or the train of our thoughts into a train of words, and that for two commodities, whereof one is the registering of the consequence of our thoughts, which being apt to slip out of our memory and put us to a new labor, may again be recalled by such words as they were marked by. So that the use of names, the first use of names, is to serve for markers or notes of remembrance. Another is, when many use the same words, to signify by their connection and order, one to another, what they conceive or think of each matter, and also what they desire, fear, or have any other passion for. And for this they are called, or sorry, and for this use they are called signs. Special uses of speech are these, first, to register what by cogitation we find to be the cause of any thing, present or past, and what we find things present or past may produce or affect, which in some is acquiring of arts. Secondly, to show others that knowledge which we have attained, which is to counsel and teach one another. Thirdly, to make known to others our wills, our purposes, that we may have the mutual help of one another. Fourthly, to please and delight ourselves and others by playing with our words for pleasure or ornament, innocently. So there's lots of things we can do with speech here, Hobbes is saying, but the general use of speech is to take our mental discourse and turn it into verbal discourse, right? Turn the train of thoughts into a train of words. We can use language to help us think. And this is really interesting because it's not only connected to the ancient view of Logos, right? The Greeks used the same word for language as they did for reason, Logos. So it's no surprise that Hobbes is doing that here. And Hobbes also notes some interesting uses of language. Probably the most important is to name things, uh, to allow us to talk about our thoughts to other people. Uh, there's a noticeable uh, similarity with Descartes there, right? Declaring our thoughts to others. Um, we can use language in our thinking and reason out uh, consequences of things and state them. Um, we can also teach one another. We can learn things. Uh, we can play with words, right? We can write poems and stuff, right? There's lots we can do with words, but the main, um, the big important one for Hobbes is how language helps to buttress our thinking, kind of supports thinking. A couple of uh, other interesting things here real quick. Uh, Hobbes does talk a little bit about different kinds of names. Uh, there are universal names, uh, for example, that we use to describe uh, similitude in qualities and other accidents, he says. Uh, but then there are also proper names, which we only give to one thing right? Like, um, my name is Josh, or uh, the city that I live in is named Ottawa, right? These are proper names, proper nouns. Hobbes writes, one universal name is imposed on many things for their similitude in some quality or other accident. And whereas a proper name 
uh, bringeth to mind one thing only. Universals recall any one of those many. So, uh, kind of like particulars and universals uh, from Aristotle's philosophy. <laughs> I think really interestingly, though, is how language kind of uh, beefs up our ability to think, like I mentioned a moment ago. And Hobbes has a little bit uh, to say about that here. Um, he tells us not just how language helps us to think. He tells us here... Uh, not just that language helps us to think, but he also offers some really interesting examples, uh, say with mathematics and geometry, that paint an interesting picture of how he thinks thinking actually works. Uh, so let's take a look at this quote here from chapter four. So Hobbes writes, by this imposition of names, some of larger, some of stricter signification, we turn the reckoning of the consequences of things imagined in the mind into a reckoning of the consequences of applications. For example, a man that hath no use of speech at all, such as is born and remains perfectly deaf and dumb, he can't hear or speak, uh, if he set before his eyes a triangle, and by it two right angles, such as are the corners of a square figure, he may, by mediation, compare them and find that the three angles of that triangle are equal to those two right angles uh, that stand by it. But if another, another triangle be shown to him different in shape from the former, he cannot know without a new labor whether th the three angles of that also be equal to the same. But he that hath the use of words, when he observes that such equality was consequent, not to the length of the sides, nor to any other particular thing in his triangle, but only to this, that the sides were straight and the angles three, and that, uh, and that that was all for which he named it a triangle, will boldly conclude universally that such equality of angles is in all triangles whatsoever, and register his invention in these general terms. Every triangle hath its three angles equal to two right angles, and thus the consequence found in one particular comes to be registered and remembered as a universal rule, and discharges our mental reckoning of time and place, and delivers us from all labor of mind, solving the first, and makes that which was found true here and now to be true in all times and places. So try and unpack this example a bit. Hobbes is saying, you know, imagine a guy who couldn't use language. Maybe he is uh, deaf and dumb from birth, so he can't hear or speak and he never acquired language. And if you showed him a particular triangle with a couple of right angles next to it, he could figure out some properties of that triangle, but that triangle only. If he wanted to know uh, that these properties hold for all triangles, well, he would have to try it out on another triangle and another and another, right? But someone who has language can come up with terms like triangle and right angle. Uh, these words contain uh, information. These are complicated concepts that we can encode since we have language. Someone who has language and who knows what a triangle is uh, just knows that, quote, uh, every triangle hath its three angles, uh, three angles equal to two right angles, right? You just know that if you know the word triangle. So language kind of beefs up our ability to think. And it happens in a mechanistic way, as we'll see. Uh, not just how we come to acquire these concepts, but how we actually use them in our reasoning is quite mechanistic as well. So Hobbes continues here, but the use of words in registering our thoughts is in nothing so evident as in numbering. A natural fool that could never learn by heart the order of the numeral words as one, two, and three may observe every stroke of the clock and nod to it or say one, 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 but can never know what hour it strikes. And it seems there was a time when those names of number were not in use, and when men were fain to apply their fingers of one or both hands to those things they desired to keep account of, and that thence it proceeded that 
now our numeral words are but ten in any nation, and in some but five, and then they begin again. So there's Hobbes is saying, you know, before there were counting systems, we counted on our fingers, and even now, uh, some counting systems only go up to ten and then start over again. Uh, so there are simpler counting systems and more complicated counting systems. <coughs> Uh, to continue, quote, And he that can, can tell ten, if he recite them out of order, will lose himself and not know when he has done. Much less will he be able to add and subtract and perform all other operations of arithmetic. So that without words, there is no possibility of reckoning numbers, much less of magnitude, of swiftness, of force, and of other things. The reckonings whereof are necessary uh, to the being or well-being of mankind. When two names are joined together into a consequence or affirmation, as thus, a man is a living creature, or thus, if he be a man, he is a living creature. If the latter name living creature signify all that the former name man signifieth, then the affirmation or consequence is true, otherwise false. For true and false are attributes of speech, not of things. And where speech is not, there is neither truth nor nor falsehood. Error there may be, as when we expect that which shall not be, or suspect what has not been, but neither, uh, but in neither case can a man be charged with untruth. Um, I guess an interesting way of making sense of what Hobbes is saying here is that what we do with words when we think, when we think with words and reason with words, it's kind of like doing math, right? Um, Thinking is a mechanistic, uh, systematic process, kind of like doing math. But he's also saying that we couldn't do the kinds of things we can do in math without words. Um, words, uh, words for numbers, uh, words, not just words, but really uh, words for concepts, which is why I think all of this is so interesting. I'll get to that in a moment, though. First, finally, coming back to what is understanding. Quote, When a man, upon hearing of any speech, hath those thoughts which the word of that speech and their connection were ordained and con constituted to signify, then he is said to understand it, understanding being nothing else but conception caused by speech. And therefore, if speech be peculiar to man, as for aught I know it is, uh, again, we're the only creatures who do this, just like Aristotle and Descartes observed. Um, <clears throat> if speech is particular to man, then is understanding particular to him also. And therefore, of absurd and false affirmations, in case they be universal, there can be no understanding, though many think they understand, then, when they do not, but repeat the words softly, or con them in their mind. Um... So we understand things. Understanding is something that we can do uh, because of language. Um, when, we, when we have a conception caused by speech, uh, say triangle, I say triangle, and you have a conception of a three-sided figure with internal angles that uh, add up to, to right angles, uh, or you know, two, 90 degrees is a right angle, 90 times two, 180 degrees. That's the sum of the three angles in a triangle. There you go. When I say triangle, you have a conception of that. You have a concept of a triangle, which I can kind of trigger in your brain by saying the word. And you can remember by remembering the word. This is what language does for us. It allows us to acquire new concepts and to employ them in our reasoning. And reasoning is like a systematic step-by-step -step causal process. Um, Hobbes and, I, and I, I hope I'm not reading into him here, but he seems to foreshadow the view of computation that we will look at later. But I'm getting, my head, uh, getting ahead of myself a little bit here. The really interesting thing that I think Hobbes is doing is foreshadowing an idea that you can read about in uh, this book by Andy Clark. This is called Mindware. Andy Clark is a philosopher of mind uh, who writes a lot about uh, something that he calls cognitive technology. I've done a couple of lectures for a previous class where I used this textbook. 
Uh, and I'll link some cards for those lectures up here in case you like to take a look. But cognitive technology is not what you think it is. It's not, you know, cybernetic implants in your brain. Uh, cognitive technology is a tool that helps us to think. It could be something as simple as a pencil and paper when you're doing arithmetic. Something to offload some of the cognition into the external world. And Clark actually argues that language works like a cognitive technology. Um, we can use linguistic labels uh, to kind of um, tag new concepts. Uh, these labels allow us to learn new concepts. And I give examples of these, which Clark also gives in the lectures that I'll place in these cards up here. So if you want to know what cognitive technology is and how language works as a cognitive technology, that is a tool uh, that we use to kind of beef up our cognition or our thinking, uh, check out this book or check out those lectures. Or, um, you know, uh, talk to me or place a, place a point of discussion in this week's uh, discussion forum. Right? If you're interested, there's lots of ways I can uh, get you more resources about this, is what I'm saying. Give me my little soulless automaton! Hi! Oh, hi! Oh, oh. By the way, everyone, I don't think that I am any less of a soulless automaton than my pupper here, so don't worry. So chapter 5 is where Hobbes finally starts telling us what reason is in general, or at least where he devotes uh, space to talking primarily about reason. Oh, my pupper left. He writes, When a man reasoneth, he does nothing else but conceive a sum total from addition of parcels, or conceive a remainder from subtractions of one sum from another which, if it be done by words, is conceiving of the consequences of the names of all the parts to the name of the whole, or from the names of the whole and one part to the name of the other part. Uh, that was a mouthful. Come here! Hi! Hi! Hello again! Uh, and though in some things, as in numbers, uh, besides adding and subtracting, men name other operations as multiplying and dividing. Yet they are the same, for multiplication is but addition together of things equal, and division but subtraction of one thing, as often as we can. These operations are not incident to numbers only, but to all manner of things that can be added together and taken one out of another. Interesting. So Hobbes continues, out of all which we, we, we <clears throat> so Hobbes continues, out of all which we may define, that is to say determine what that is, which is meant by this word reason, when we reckon it amongst the faculties of the mind. For reason in this sense is nothing but reckoning, that is adding and subtracting of the consequences of general names agreed upon for the marking and signifying of our thoughts. I say marking them when we reckon by ourselves and signifying when we demonstrate or approve our reckonings to other men. So this is quite a mechanical account of reasoning, and I think it foreshadows the computational representational theory of mind that we will look at when we examine the works of Alan Turing and Hilary Putnam. The computational representational theory of mind treats the mind like a computer, and the computer operates on representations algorithmically in a rule-governed way. It's step-by-step rule-governed process. After all, Hobbes is saying here that reasoning is a lot like uh, doing mathematics, like doing additioning or, or subtraction or whatnot. In fact, we are reasoning when we do it, uh, when we do mathematics, uh, but we're reasoning more generally when we use words and concepts in a similar kind of way when we think uh, to how we use numbers when we do arithmetic. Um, we're adding things together and trying to understand the consequences taking things away and looking at what that implies. Uh, this, is, this is kind of like how uh, the Greeks did logic, right? Like, you know, uh, syllogisms and stuff. 
Uh, Socrates is a man, all men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal, right? Uh, so, um, thinking, reasoning for Hobbes is a very mechanical process. He doesn't talk about it being rule-governed explicitly, but it certainly sounds like he's talking about uh, thinking as a sort of rule-governed uh, transitions between states of the mind where the contents of those states are words or concepts. And that is very similar to the modern picture of the mind. I mean the present picture of the mind that we have in the 20th and 21st centuries. What is science? Remember, this is the time period when science and natural philosophy are still kind of the same thing. So what does Hobbes say about science? Well, he says, By this it appears that reason is not as sense and memory born with us, nor gotten by experience onely, as prudence is, but attained by industry, first in apt imposing of names, and secondly by getting a good and orderly method in proceeding from the elements which are names, to assertions made by connection of one of them to another, and so on to syllogisms, which are the connections of one assertion to another, till we come to a knowledge of all the consequences of names appertaining to the subject in hand. And that uh, is it, men call science. And whereas sense and memory are but knowledge of fact, which, uh, which is a thing past and irrevocable, science is the knowledge of consequences and dependence of one fact upon another. By which, out of that we can presently do, we know how to do something else, when we will, or the like, another time. Because when we see how anything comes about, upon what causes and by what manner, when the like causes come into our power, we see how to make it produce the like effects. So, what science is for Hobbes is kind of like a, a general reasoning. Uh, uh, knowledge of the consequences of propositions or states of affairs, which we can uh, kind of internalize or encode as knowledge, as concepts and this kind of thing. Again, um, not exactly how um, a modern scientist would put it, but not exactly not how a modern scientist would put it, right? Um, this is very much in line with what science can do. Uh, when, when we have knowledge of one phenomenon, we can predict another phenomenon, and we can do experiments this, this way. We can generate predictions and try to falsify them, right? This is, this is still quite a lot like modern science. Uh, but here, T Hobbes is kind of talking about science as a way to exercise our reason with the knowledge we have, right? So, anyway, uh, that is science uh, and reason, chapter 5. That's what I wanted to draw your attention to today. Well, that's just about everything. As I said, I just kind of wanted to draw your attention towards some of those parts of chapters 1 through 5 where Hobbes is really mechanistic in terms of what he's doing, um, and kind of riff on everything a bit. So this lecture is going to end up being a little bit shorter than usual, but I don't imagine any of you will mind. Also, I have an announcement. I'm going to be changing up the schedule for next week. Uh, initially, we were going to read Man a Machine for next week, and we'd have two lectures next week on Man a Machine. What I'm going to do is move those lectures to the week after reading week. And I'm going to move the how to write an essay lecture to next week. That means next week there will only be one lecture. Again, I'm sure, I'm sure you don't mind. Uh, but if you do mind, then feel free to complain about it to me. That's fine. So there's only going to be one lecture, which means that you can use the extra time to give yourself a bit of a breather, study up a little bit, or, and this is what I recommend you do, watch the uh, essay writing lecture and confer with me about your essay topic proposals, right? Uh, I'll include a little bit of lecture about how to do a good essay topic proposal, as well as how to write a good essay. And if you want to, you can reach out to me over Reading Week. Uh, we can talk via email, or we can set up a meeting on my Discord server, and we can talk shop about your essays. 
Another reason I'm doing this uh, bit of rescheduling is so that I can get you your feedback for reading response one. I'll probably push back the due date for reading response two by a couple of days, just like I did with reading response one. I'll post an updated course outline that reflects all of these changes for the start of next week. But just know that you'll have a little bit more time to do reading response two. And this way, um, we can talk about the essay before reading week. You can get started on your topic proposal and maybe even your paper. And I'll have time, I'll have more time because it's reading week to meet with you virtually if you want to meet and ask me about how to write a really good essay. So that's why we're doing it this way. Uh, and I'll post an announcement when I've updated everything and when the course outline and, and all of that rescheduled stuff has been taken care of. Okay. Anyway, that's it for today. Uh, no readings for next week because it's just going to be all about how to write a lecture and there's only one lecture. So the remaining time for next week, say Wednesday onward and all the way through reading week, feel free to contact me about, well, anything really, but especially about your essay proposal and your essay assignment. Uh, contact me about any aspects of those things that you need assistance with. All right. Um, so that is it for today. I will see you all next time with my one and only lecture for next week, how to write a really good essay for Minds and Machines. All right. I'll see you then, everybody. Bye for now.